Oh, hello. How do you do? Okay, cut, cut. You're supposed to roar like in Jurassic Park. Oh, but that wasn't moi. That was sound effects, darling. I feel every collector of watches comes to a crossroad in their journey where they feel closer to the end than to the beginning and perhaps consider calling it quits. Others say that the collecting of things never really stops in a perpetual Euroboros-like cycle. It's about the journey and not the destination. So today I want to discuss why I'm most likely going to stop collecting watches in the next few years and why my watch collecting goals have changed so dramatically over the past 12 months or so. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. I'll start off, of course, with a wristwatch check. Very fitting for today's video, as this is my Navi timer. I'm wearing it on the original bracelet, which I don't do too often, but I'm absolutely loving it. And it's fitting for today's video because it is a watch that, despite owning one already, and I'm very happy with it, I do go on eBay pretty much every week, and I stalk <laughs> other versions of the Navi timer. Um, I have a Navi timer problem, but there we go. During a recent trip abroad, as part of a mini tour of several European countries to produce content for the coming months, I was reminded of the purity and slight feeling of liberation when traveling with a super focused, downsized mini collection. Feel the weight of that bag. You don't need to carry all that weight. Why don't you set that bag down? The slower we move, the faster we die. We are not swans, we're sharks like a horological version of the movie Up in the Air. But it grows old rather quick, and I soon start missing some of the watches sitting back home, safe in the bank vault. I find it's always a consistent struggle between the desire for ownership and the seller's remorse of past ownership. Especially when you see the watch you've sold off to pay for the next one on the wrist of somebody else, or in the movie, or just a passing billboard. I'm sure we've all been there. And I think this is exacerbated somewhat with social media. I know every time I see the Tissot Janeiro, I'm instantly checking for prices five minutes later on eBay. So the past 12 months has been probably the most interesting in terms of my watch journey. Seeing me falling for brands and styles I would never have imagined enjoying, let alone becoming so obsessed about. In a recent video where I discussed my shifting changes in tastes and opinions, a gentry commentator named Bani Naiba, and I apologize if I'm butchering that, left a really interesting comment saying it was essentially a sign of becoming, and I quote, a true connoisseur when you start to establish your own tastes rather than following the crowd with whatever the current hype is all about. Now, I feel there's a lot of truth to that. And guys, let me know what you think in the comments. Now, I would never call myself a connoisseur or an expert, or even an aficionado. It's kind of like how the term gentleman works. It would be simply classless and arrogant to call myself a gentleman, and by extension give myself any of the previously mentioned titles. Those are terms for others to give you. I am just a humble enthusiast, and that word is absolutely key here. In my opinion, for me, it's about the chase of that enthusiasm. Finding watches that just when you thought you were out. They pull me back in. This almost always happens with watches I didn't plan on acquiring or unexpected new releases that you just fall in love with. Speaking of which, while I was on my travels, the F77 finally arrived from Nevada Grenchen. Immediately that blue just hits. Oh, wow, it's a little bit more blue than I expected, but then again, it is under the studio lights. Definitely one of the hottest brands of the year. Yeah, just tremendous, just tremendous. Look at that. I just love the profile, that 
kind of more vintagey. The roll log is flat, the, the crystal, I, I mean, the one I owned at least. I've talked about this Swiss heritage brand quite a lot recently, offering a great value to quality ratio, but perhaps most importantly, watches that scratch certain itches. No matter if it's the 70s Genta-esque sports watch trend, that seems to be very much in vogue lately. In fact, C. Ward just put out something similar too while I was away. Their own cool take on the whole Genta style. But Nevada Grenchen also do affordable alternatives of vintage explorers with the Antarctic. Radio mirror like divers that go even deeper depths than Panerai, and of course their most iconic watch, the Chrono Master. So I was really lucky in managing to snag an F77 from the first batch that deservedly sold out very fast indeed. If you missed out on one, I do believe they will be restocking later this year. So before I quit, there are some watches I still kind of want to add, some watches that don't even exist that I'm praying, you know, uh, for Chamon Le Cord and that. So as you guys know, I've fallen for Panerai recently in a very big way. And I think we can deduce from the recent release of a Radium in the Quaranta size, before that Panerai Due in the 38 millimeters, and a few years previous, the Quaranta Luminor, which I own the previous version of. I think what's next, we can only uh, kind of hope is a submersible in a 40 millimeter size. I hope so. I absolutely adore that watch, but always too big for me. I wear my Luminor jogging. Just adds a whole level of extra practicality. Cardio with that bezel would just be, well, I could get rid of a few more of my uh, divers. I wouldn't need them. Like in any industry, when you see how the sausage is really made, some of the magic inevitably fades. Because having designed and co-designed watches for half a dozen brands now, with being so involved in the development of so many watches, you really get to comprehend what goes into it. This is perhaps the most educational aspect beyond even what an actual watchmaker sees. As you get to learn about every single process, from the simple idea in your mind, turning that into a design, the research involved, developing the materials, legal aspects, budgeting, testing, manufacture, more testing, QC, marketing, etc. It's a gestation process that takes about a year and sometimes even more. And this is something that all hate-filled horological keyboard warriors unfortunately will never understand. So it's only until you've gone through this process yourself that you can really understand the enormity in the task of making a watch a physical reality. The upside is it does give you an appreciation of some brands and the downside is it gives you a disdain for others that um, you know you kind of learn are a bit disingenuous. Let's keep it positive. Happy thoughts, happy thoughts. <laughs>
So recently I acquired this. This is a gold tone version of my wife's Casio, which I previously reviewed. Check it out if you missed it. One of the best releases from Casio in recent years, hands down. I put my money where my mouth is and I couldn't resist it. They're not that expensive. It's funny, I, I put this on and I start thinking a bit like when I was traveling, do I really need all these watches? I mean, this, a tourbillon, and maybe, um, a diver and that's about it. Seriously, what more do you want? I guess this is the madness of collecting. For formal attire, casual and a beta, I think three is the ideal number, but of course I will never get down to that. My long-term goal has always been the Roman Gautier Insight Micro Rotor. After seeing firsthand the independent watchmaker himself demonstrate each meticulous process involved from start to finish in his factory in Switzerland, I couldn't help but love it. Not to mention its alluring confluence of restrained classical elegance, but with modern and traditional horturology techniques in its production. But it's not a surprise, it's really expensive, and I mean really expensive. Something that goes against the old money sensibilities I partly inherited off my mother. Spending this kind of money on a single watch would be considered by her a tad vulgar, perhaps even ghastly. But then again, if I lived my own life by an old world set of now dated values and limited tastes, it would get so boring. I also often think what my grandfather and role model GHW would buy if he was alive today and wanted to upgrade his Charles Frodsham pocket watch. I think he would approve of my ultra thin AP dress watch with its JLC based manual wind movement for more formal situations or when he drove one of his Rolls Royces around. But for the rest of the time, I think he'd choose a Rolex Explorer for when he's hunting, pottering around in the garden or riding his horses, in a more casual kind of Ian Fleming beta watch manner. So unfortunately, or maybe it's fortunate, I didn't inherit any of that old money. Uh, I inherited a pocket watch, uh, my grandfather's pocket watch, which you saw in the intro. I work two jobs. There's no silver spoon here. I work two jobs. I work seven days a week sometimes six days a week. I do try and have a day off every so often and I work damn hard. In my heart, I feel I appreciate the watches I end up buying and saving up for and, you know, enjoying the process of finally getting it so much more. I can't buy everything I want. You know, I don't have that DuckTales money and I think it's a good thing. I think it would kill the, the hobby if I could just buy any watch I want just like this. So it's going to happen one day, you know, where I end up with a tourbillon, a Casio and maybe a, a third watch, a diver of some kind, you know? I could see that happening, but will I be happy? Will I be happier? That's the question. What do you guys think? In the meantime, there are some, you know, some last little uh, dalliances I have to have with certain watches and certain brands. What? Nothing, you stick out like a sore thumb around here. Me, what about you? I fit in better than you. At least I'm wearing cowboy boots. Oh, yeah, you blend. There's also my Italian side. Without stereotyping, it's, well, shall we say, a little bit more passionate and always adds to my confusion. Like many of my New York friends and family, it inspired my desire to acquire a day date. And I still adore that watch, by the way. Seeing the Italian design genius, Giugiaro, wearing his Hublot Classic with such stylish sprezzatura has actually got me really considering one as well. Not to mention having the bonus side effect of upsetting the delicate sensibilities of all the man-baby watch snobs who absolutely hate the brand. Speaking of motor racing and being a contrarian, the Zenith Chronomaster Sport has always got me looking at my Rolex watches and considering me flipping one for it. That is certainly a watch I need to have some time with before I make such big choices. Maybe a good compromise of all these contrarian and horological desires would of course be a Grand Seiko. Now I feel for a lot of watch enthusiasts, all roads lead to Grand Seiko, so to speak. I think they always get there eventually or consider one, right? Now I will be reviewing and familiarizing myself more with the brand hands-on, uh, so stay tuned for that. But I will not buy one until I make that trip to Japan because I want to commemorate it with a watch. It's something very special. I love Japanese culture and art and cinema, Kurosawa and all the rest of it. There's nothing better than to commemorate an event in one's life than with a watch. And if I see it and buy it there, I think that's even, you know, then it's more difficult to sell. 
as well because you have that sentimental, irreplaceable connection to it. Then to add more confusion to the proceedings, recently I have learned about FC, Frédéric Constant, releasing the most affordable Swiss-made tourbillon to the market. Now, I've never really been interested in owning that particular complication before, something I attribute more to the vulgarity of brash, oversized watch brands like Richard Miele and so on, with their respective price tags for those with more money and class. But the cleanly balanced design of the FC, a brand I'm very much growing to respect, having over 30 proprietary calibers in their repertoire, along with it being very modestly sized, especially considering what it houses movement-wise, and it being just so beautifully classic and good taste, it's something I feel GHW would actually approve of and has got me now considering an up-in-the-air style drastic consolidation. Recently, I had to service a Rolex Submariner and my Rolex Explorer. The cost to that was huge. Even if I went with an independent, I can't imagine how much it cost and how long I'd have to wait if it went to Rolex. With a huge collection, I'm basically paying the price of a new luxury watch each year just to maintain it, which is crazy. So there's that to consider as well. There is certainly something to be said about getting to know a watch over a longer period of time with true ownership. Collaborations like co-designing the sold out Carl Friedrich Unico case, a limited edition watch once a year, I don't want to overdo it, or designing straps for Wrist Candy Watch Club like the Valor strap all help to keep the channel going in a way that does not compromise its integrity. And trust me, making videos, even one as relatively simple as this, is extremely time consuming and expensive. But by offering products I love, use myself and put my passion into, I think it's a really fair way to do it. But not owning a massive collection myself, does that undermine the channel and my opinions that I've worked so tirelessly to protect? And why do I bring this up? Well, integrity is vital. Will I lose credibility if I don't have a vast collection to pull from? Let's look at a good example. Would Dan Henry and his brand be able to understand how to make such compelling new watches without the access to his own world-famous collection of more than 1,500 vintage timepieces that he can get inspiration from and really feel the nuances in their design by having them in the metal. And you know what really makes my style of collecting dangerous is that I don't have a specific theme. For example, I have a friend of mine, shout out to you, you know who you are, a special friend of mine who only collects military issued watches and I envy that kind of clarity, that focus. He only buys watches every so often when they tick all these boxes. And his collection is controlled and concise and blah, blah, blah. It's not like me, out of control. Soon, before you know it, you've got 50 watches, <laughs> you know, and then multiple versions of the same. It's madness. I need to get more focus, I, I, I guess. Have I lost the plot? Have I, <laughs> have I gone mad? I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. What is your collection theme? Do share in the comments. Uh, but don't worry, I'm not quitting just yet we're, get, we're getting there but not just yet anyway guys back to regular programming in the next episode uh, let me know your thoughts uh, don't forget to like this video especially if you want to see more free and independent content like this thank you so much for watching and i'll catch you in the next one onwards and upwards ciao